the second withdrawal from the Paris Agreement comes at a more difficult time than the first withdrawal, in, in my view. In 2016, 2017, although there was geopolitical tension, um, other players, other actors were able to more confidently step in um, and work together to at least some extent, you know, in particular China, Europe, um, India and other, and other actors. This time, in a much more fragmented world and where trust has really broken down between Europe and China, kind of just walking, working past um, the US withdrawal and their absence from negotiations, their rhetorical absence, um, may be harder. And this will have some impact on progress in, in climate debates. I think the impacts on US emissions as one of the largest emitters, although no longer the largest emitter of, of greenhouse gases, is more complicated. Clearly, Donald Trump is not in favor of proactive measures to reduce emissions. But on the other hand, while the Inflation Reduction Act may be um, susceptible to, to some intervention, a lot of action in the US has happened in spite of the federal government. It's coordinated at state level, it's to do with markets, and some of it is simply just the competitiveness of new technologies like solar and wind, and you see this in Texas. American investment in mineral supply chains is key to diversifying from China. Public money is needed, and really the United States is one of the main players that has the kind of industrial capacity, the balance sheet, to really make a difference. I think it's driven by his, his whole plan, which is to America first, build American jobs, American manufacturing, a recorrect what he sees as the kind of betrayal of America, which is shifting all these jobs overseas, uh, supporting China, uh, supporting other countries uh, through offshoring. And he really is a, trying to correct that narrative and bring back manufacturing investment to the US. And I think this is sector agnostic. So he just wants to American industry to be strong. And he's thinking in terms of national security and critical minerals have got wrapped up in this idea and this discussion about, oh, national security, vulnerabilities, uh, the defense sector. And that's part of the whole shift that Trump in his first administration propelled, which is away from globalization to kind of reshoring supply chains. So that's the way he's thinking, which is, well, we, we don't want to be vulnerable. We need to build these supply chains. Um, well, where, where has these critical minerals, Greenland? I think he's very transactional. So he's asking, what can you give me uh, you know, so that we can have a deal and critical minerals, as we all know, are sort of where the geology is, they're sort of spread out around the world. So if countries have these critical minerals, um, this is something they can offer as part of a deal uh, with Trump. Uh, but the fundamental problem going back to the contradiction is if you don't incentivize demand, you don't incentivize uh, investment and critical minerals need demand and they need somewhere to go. So often lost in the debate about critical minerals is let's just do mining in the US or get critical minerals from Greenland, but where are they going to go? And at the moment, China is that buyer in the market where all these critical minerals go. So we saw under his un, under previous administrations that the biggest rare earth mine in the US, um, a Chinese company was actually allowed to acquire a stake in it and the rare earths have gone to uh, China. Um, so we probably don't want a repeat of that situation. So I think we, we, we still don't know whether he's going to support friends shoring. You know, under Biden, there was these concept of a network of alliances. You could kind of corner China or, or, or encircle China by creating new supply chains. We don't know yet if he's really going to support uh, that policy or if it's going to be America first um, and he's not interested in working with Europe, working with, with other uh, partners. That's, the, that's yet to be uh, determined. But I think if it's the America first route, countries with critical minerals can offer up uh, projects as part of their dealings, dealings with Trump. There's issues around whether US actions will be held against allies. Um, I, this is quite likely. So should the US fail to tackle methane emissions from upstream oil and gas production, this could slow down progress on an already difficult topic. And convincing other oil and gas producers to compromise on their language at, at, on, in COP declarations and, and other kind of commitments is just that bit harder when they can turn around and say, well, your key ally, your main security and trading partner 
is not interested in this, they're not doing this, and they're the world's largest producer of oil and gas. On the other hand, there are potential opportunities. Um, one of these is that in a more multipolar world, um, voices like India, the Middle Eastern countries, particularly the Gulf states, Brazil, South Africa, have are more confident in asserting their position in international forums. And I think for Europe and the UK and other um, kind of rest of the West partners to have to look outwards a little bit more and to compromise and accommodate partners is not a bad thing.